saying hello to my friend Frauke Musial. She has the wrong name in the picture, but her name is Frauke Musial from uh, Tromsø. That's your husband, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, Frauke is a biopsychologist. And before we are getting going and diving into tonight's topic, I will ask you, uh, dear Frauke, to just introduce, your, introduce yourself a little bit and um, tell us what is a biopsychologist. So, what is what is your profession? It's a, it's a bit a strange word, right? So, what what is it? It is actually? yes, uh, and I understand that not everybody has uh, an idea right away um, what this means. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in principle, it means that I'm a psychologist by training, and I have studied in Düsseldorf many many years ago in the eighties. And at that point in time, Düsseldorf had a very special education, which was in part together with a medical student. And that was called biopsychology. Biopsychology oh, yeah. is a subspecialty of psychology. And what we do is we look at behavior and then we try to find out uh, what the physiological basis of that behavior is. And likewise, we look at physiology and maybe changes and, and, and processes in physiology and see how that affects behavior. So, um, It is still a subspecialty of psychology. It has also components, and that's important when we talk about horses, it has also components of comparative psychology. And comparative psychology, yeah, comparative psychology is how different species have similarities and differences in their behavior and their physio the physiological basis of this behavior. So that's what I am by training. And, uh, but right now I actually, have a professorship in terms of healthcare research alternative treatment and the reason <laughs> why I yeah so that that's that sounds a little bit strange but many of these complementary therapies actually use intrinsic physiological mechanisms or mm -hmm. psychophysiological mechanisms and that's exactly why they wanted me as a biopsychologist I yeah, have I also a little bit of background in uh, have a strong background in pain research but a little bit of a background in placebo So that actually fits quite well. But I don't have, a, that's often a misunderstanding. Um, I don't have a professorship that deals with horses. That was, that that started as a hobby. So um, I uh, I was a good rider when I was young. So I grew up mm. with horses. And then, uh, I don't know um, if anybody knows that, and it's not that uh, important, but I, I, uh, I have MS, multiple sclerosis, and I use a wheelchair. And during the course of my disease, that idea that I could try it just disappeared. And then I moved to mm. Tromsø and I had a colleague that was breeding Icelandic horses and she put me on a horse. And ever since I'm riding again, and <laughs> I used to have until the summer two Icelandic horses. And one died, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so that's my story. And since I'm a scientist, um, yeah, that's my way to find out about things. So ever since I, of course, have uh, read everything there is to read about the biopsychology of horses and the behavior of, course. of horses and mm. the physiological foundations just because it's my special interest and my way to approach things Super. and yeah it happened then that i have started a blog science mm. for horse lovers mm. um so yes and i ran very early into selena in fact <laughs> yeah, <that's>, yeah. <laughs> And that has actually fostered. So I think we started out together with a blog before my own blog. Mm. Mm. Well, because we started yeah. to say, why is this so? Yeah, so that is true. Why is it so? Why is it so? And yeah. that's that's dangerous to do that with me because I may end up in an hour or longer um, class just teaching about why it is as it is. <laughs> yeah, sometimes when we are having coffee together, I'm coming home and think I had a day at university or something. <laughs> No. I'm sorry. No, that's, no, I'm that's, so sorry. That's exactly what I need then. Um, and uh, this is also the reason why I have invited you tonight because um, I've been speaking a lot with my students also about how the equine brain is wired, how behavior is connected and stuff, and that many things yeah, have, have, to, have just to be seen um, How do you say that in English? Uh, art, art specific or specific to the species? Species, species, yes, species exactly. specific. Mm -hmm. uh, in Germany, we are saying art specific. Sorry, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but we took it tonight in English because we said, okay, then it's accessible for everyone because I have so many students from all over the world. 
also. Um, and um, Academia's mission, or also the mission of this podcast, is to always yeah, we, we are taking up one myth at a time and we have a look at it and then we have a look at what science can tell us about one or the other thing and um, cleaning cleaning that out and leaning or falling back onto the five domain model. And that's the reason why you are here today. Um, because I have today I have brought uh, for you a very a specific, or a few very specific questions because um, a while ago, when I was um, still still young um, and before I had my child, we took a couple of webinars together talking about the biopsychology of the horse. And um, there's a few sentences that I am remembering from that biopsychology course. And one of them was that, yeah, the equine brain is wired differently. I guess we will fall back on that later. And that uh, the prefrontal cortex is different than in humans and this is also why for tonight we have the topic of um, stress fear or trauma what is it that we can talk about I have a special case on my farm I have a training horse on my farm that um, if I wouldn't have so many gray hairs I would get them only for him and uni has developed pretty nicely the the recent years since he is here but once in a while, he is still, yeah, giving me some something to think about. <clears throat> so, um, what we know about him is that he is the classical, he is the the classical misunderstood horse, the problem horse. Um, and uh, he was sold from uh, Portugal or Spain to Norway. I came to a. Uh, a really nice lady who has been trying her very best but wasn't prepared for the amount of trouble this horse has kept inside herself. And then she has been doing what every sensible horse owner is doing. She has been seeking for advice. Um, <clears throat> so eventually she ended up with a horsemanship trainer where the horse made different experiences. And um, she also asked uh, advice from veterinarians but did not get the the best advice so eventually the horse came up here for training um <clears throat> and we have been continuing searching because his behavior was so exclusive let's say it like this exclusive and what we found after a while when he didn't want to get touched and then was just protecting his body um was was uh, several pain factors inside his body and since we have been eliminating them the horse is behaving differently of course so, but still, I just, the other day, I took him out. I took him out of the paddock. I wanted to do him a favor. My One of my youngsters was mobbing him and didn't allow him to eat his minerals. I took him out and put him on a, on the small paddock next to the riding arena. And uh, then Uni was standing there eating. And I, I closed the paddock. And when I wanted to come back in, everything so far was normal. I wanted to come back in and um, had a rope in my hand. And I saw Uni looking at the rope. And then Uni changed his mindset completely. I couldn't touch him anymore. And he was just circling around me. So, Frauke, that was a crash course into Uni's story. Um, is that trauma? Or what is that that we are seeing here? Yeah. That's a complex story, and I, I can I can only speculate. But have you been? Have you seen that reaction to to the rope before? I have been seeing videos from him on Instagram where he has been showing um, this behavior, or I have been seeing the round pen work that was not very sensitive. And I have been uh, I had the trouble with him when I started longing uh, him that he was just mindless; he didn't stop running. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you that's not the first time you came in there with a rope. And I understand that as soon as you use a rope, he starts running, uh, circling around you. Yeah. And also when the space is limited. Also, you know, you... when this when the space is limited, usually when he's on the okay. big field, he doesn't care. But now I put oh. him into a small paddock. Okay. He couldn't escape. It was more... Uh, a particular setup than what he's used to do. You know, my riding arena doesn't even have walls. So 
nothing has walls here. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you use the rope and he can withdraw, it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. He stays voluntarily with mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, several things. Um, first of all, the, the horse's brain is wired differently. Yes and no. <laughs> So principally, and, and I, I really need to say that because I'm sometimes really surprised what I find out there about horses and how special they are. And horses' brains, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So principally, mammals have the same brain structure. Oh, that's why they're mammals. And birds have the same brain structure. And uh, I don't know, um, fish have the brain, same brain structure. That's That's the category, right? So, and but mammals have been extremely successful to conquer every type of habitat you find in this earth, right? But mammals mm. have always the same things. They have one nose, they have a tail, they have four arms or foot, whatever you, you, you call it. They have two eyes, right? But if you look at all the mammals, for example, if, if you focus on the eye, a mm. mole has almost no eyes. But it still yeah, has eyes, true. but almost yeah. no eyes. Mm. Yeah. But the horse has the biggest eyes of all land living animals. So why on earth, when, if you see all the variety, think of an elephant. Mm -hmm. A mole has a nose, a horse has a nose, and an elephant has a nose. <laughs> so think, think about all the mammals. Just take a minute to think about mm -hmm. what kind of mammals you know. And in what kind of varieties they come and how perfectly they are adjusted to their environment. To the niche, yeah. Mm. And to the niche they are. So why yeah. would somebody on earth think that their brains are alike? Yeah. But, but the brains have the same thing. Um, they have a nose, they have eyes, they have so they have a visual cortex, a visual part of the brain, they have an olfactory part of the brain, mm -hmm. they have a motor part of the brain where all the, the motor uh, um, the limbs are represented. But how this occurs, how big it the mole probably doesn't have a very strong, a very big part of the brain devoted to to eyes, to the eyes or to looking. It probably has a much bigger part of his brain devoted to smelling, to the sense what of what makes sense for him, right? Yeah. So, so the thing is, brains have brains have like mammals, uh, as the mammal brain, like the mammal author appearance, um, has principally brain, uh, the same structure. But how this is sort of um, developed? What is more developed? What is not more developed? Is related to the niche that animal lives in. So yes and no. Principally, mm -hmm. all mammals have the same brain structure. But how it appears may be very different according to the niche they live, because the niche will form their bodies and, and their senses, and their bodies and their senses will form how their brain looks like. Mm -hmm. So, which brings me to the discussion about the prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. um, because there's this huge discussion going on, do horses have a prefrontal cortex? And yes, I'm sure they have, even though nobody has shown that, but we know sheep has a prefrontal cortex, mice have a prefrontal cortex, rex has a prefrontal cortex, cats have a prefrontal cortex, even whales, everybody knows that whales can solve tasks that require a prefrontal cortex, but nobody could find it. Could find for years thing. and years, for decades, they have searched after the prefrontal cortex of whales. And there's just the publication out that's showing where the prefrontal cortex of the whale is. It's sort of covered and hidden. Mm. So every single species that has been investigated, mammal species that has been investigated has shown a prefrontal cortex. The thing is primates and humans have an extremely large prefrontal cortex, but they are the exception to the rule. The thing mm. is when we come, well, it's, if, if you guys think, wow, why is he talking about the prefrontal cortex? It is, in fact, important to understand fears and anxiety and how to overcome them. Because the prefrontal cortex is what makes you overcome fear. It is connected to a network that makes you overcome fear. And this is why humans can go to war. They have, and mm. the humans of primates are the exception to the rule because they have an extremely overdeveloped prefrontal cortex. And this is why they can, um, yeah, um, they, they, they can be intrigued, they can make schemes and plans and so on. So we have to keep mm. that in mind that not the horse is the one that's different. 
it's the primates and the humans that differ from the rest of the mammalian in that they have this overdeveloped prefrontal cortex. It is helpful in many ways, but it is also a problem in many other ways. In many ways, <laughs> especially so, when you're thinking about the water technology. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> yeah. exactly. But, but back to your horse. No, or just you have a question to when you no, just um, you have just said something um, that that I think is very important and therefore I would like to frame that a little bit and um, you know underline it and that is that humans are the exception to the rule yes and I do believe that if we are understanding that then we also start to to become a little bit more careful with just interpreting from our human perspective behavior of different species Yes, I think the worst, the, the biggest pest in in dealing with horses and horse training is anthropomorphism. Yeah, that's the worst thing. Um, if you could just refrain from anthropomorphism, uh, I think uh, the world of most of the horses could be a bit better. Of many be a horses, a bit better. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> so, <laughs> so okay. When that said, um, about your horse. Um, no, <clears throat> understanding stress, you said, is important, uh, or understanding the prefrontal cortex is important for understanding stress and fear. Okay, so if it's okay for you, I would yeah. make another another loop and yeah, take, absolutely. Uh, take a human example, mm -hmm. not to be anthropomorph uh, anthrop okay. uh, anthropomorphic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about fears, we have a network. Um, and that's also the same in all all and all mammals. Um, it has four structures. It has a hypothalamus, that is a region in the brain that is uh, very much involved in hormonal secretion and regulation. We have the amygdala, which is the sub uh, the structure in the brain that sort of um, in triggers the motor programs for the fight flight response. So the amygdala is absolutely central in the fight flight response, which is a stress response. Uh, and then there is a, a structure called hippocampus that's important for memory. And then of course a structure called thalamus. And the thalamus is also called the gateway to consciousness because every, every um, um, now I, I have to think about the, the English word, every impression of your, our senses, like the visual sense, the hearing, uh, all senses are rooted with the exception of olfaction. Olfaction is a big mm. exception. But everything else is rooted through the thalamus and then distributed. And when something, for, for example, we see um, a saber-toothed tiger, then that, so the picture of the saber-toothed tiger goes through mm -hmm. the thalamus and activates the amygdala because we have to run. And then the amygdala yeah. starts all kinds of programs um, that enable us to automatically run and not think. We don't think in that moment, we just run if we have this extreme stress response. And the memory structure of that will remind us, will, will save that experience for the next time. So the next time we see something, we run earlier. So that's this is how, this whole network. And then the mm -hmm. hypothalamus provides us with the stress hormones. Um, now, to the humans, mm -hmm. but humans are hunters and they're social hunters. So our ancestors, when they hunted the mammoths, if they had had this unreflected fear response that is triggered through the amygdala, we would have not survived. <laughs> we would never have dinner at least. No, we, and, and the world would probably be a much better place. But anyway, so humans can do something. They can overcome their fear. And that is this overdeveloped, monstrous prefrontal cortex. The, the, this, this really gigantic um, prefrontal cortex enables us to control our emotions, especially fear. Mm -hmm. So it's not that all the animals don't have it, but we as social hunters, we were, it was necessary for us as a species to develop that to the largest extent possible. Mm -hmm. So, when, but there is something in humans that reminds us how it was before we had this big prefrontal cortex, and that is phobias. Have you ever? 
<laughs> nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. And it's it's really it's it's so interesting because as as myself, and that, that's probably why I'm, I'm so interested in, in uh, horses as a flight animal, I have myself worked on emotions and, and phobias. And we were we were using spider phobics as mm. uh, study participants. Because mm. spider phobics are wonderful. Spider phobics have no other problem. They just have this extreme fear of uh, spiders. They're not distressed. They're not overly anxious. Some of them were really tough. But as soon as there was a spider in the room, they would just go bananas. And they had mm -hmm. a hard time controlling it. And the thing is, I don't know whether you remember that old ad on, on some kind of cleaning um, 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 detergent. Yeah. yeah. Where the, the lady would just stay beside herself and say, well, this doesn't look good. And that's sort of the the thing <laughs> with, with spider phobics. They, they stand beside themselves. They have this panic attack because of that little spider. And they, so big, they, yeah. they tell themselves it's not dangerous and they can't control it. Interesting, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and we did studies on that. So what do you do with a spider phobic? I hope this is interesting enough for, for Absolutely. people. Absolutely, go for okay. it. <laughs> So what, what we did, we looked at their brains. So we did an uh, electroencephalogram and we did evoke potentials, mm -hmm. and which means uh, we can, when people see pictures, we can look at their brain response. And those responses can be different. They can be higher or lower, mm -hmm. or something like this. So, but we, we measure them. And if, if a stimulus is of special importance, then they're, they're quite, they can be quite big. And extreme and at the same time we were looking at heart rate and all the cardiovascular variables and blood pressure and and also when you're anxious you start sweating so we were also measuring that so these are variables that are connected to the autonomic nervous system which is the nervous system that sort of um mediates that stress response also the relaxation response both parts so you your muscles um as you get sweaty your heart rate goes up, your blood is pumped out of your uh, intestines into the musculature and so on and so on. And then we also looked at the brain in parallel. So what do you do with spirophobics? You do a therapy called systematic desensitization. Desensitization. Mm -hmm. So so you work with a hierarchy, hierarchy uh, of uh, an anxiety inducing or fear inducing stimuli. And then you walk yourself down. We actually had a tarantula at the department in Jena. And um, so the, the, the lowest stressor would be, I think about a spider. And then the, the spider comes near and, and so on. So we would walk, we would first work on this uh, mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. give them. then we would teach them a relaxation technique. And then we would start with, the, and the most threatening stimulus was in fact, not to put this big tarantula on your hands because that's quite hairy. So that big tarantula actually was not the worst thing to do. It was like, I, I remember, I remember. <laughs> but going into the basement and catch ah. the spike of those fast moving spiders, that was the worst. And we had this really nice uh, basement with many, many spiders. Ah. In the that time. sounds pretty mean, actually. <clears throat> yeah, it was pretty mean. Mm. And, and they, mm. were, they were really tough. So we, we did that actually in half a day. Mm. So we were starting with the, the lowest anxiety inducing stimulus and in the end they were able to have this tarantula on the hands and also to go into the basement and catch the spider. So the therapy was successful and it was, I have to say what, what I really liked in these studies is how these people were proud of themselves because they didn't understand why they reacted that way. They were so proud, and many of them reported that it has changed their life. Wow. But, yeah, it, and, and I understand that, because it makes it, I have, this is my biggest fear, but I did it. Mm -hmm. And that is great. That's really huge, right? Yeah. So I think, yes, if, if this is, I mean, I can't sit out in the garden and have a beer because I'm so afraid of spiders. Some of them really are there. But anyway, back to the study. So we had the stress response of the autonomic variables and we had this response in the brain. Mm -hmm. So we were measuring them for before and after. And before, of course, we had this huge reaction. This heart mm -hmm. rate was racing and the hands were sweating and, and we had this monstrous evoked potential in the brain. And also the, when, when you give them an array of flowers and then hide a spider, 
the visual attention would be bop. Nobody's as uh, good as spotting, as spotting a spider than a spider phobic. Of course. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm. You see them everywhere. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. You see them everywhere. Nobody nobody sees a spider, but they can tell you there are five spiders in the world. <laughs> and you know what the funny thing is? Mm. They can they can still do that after therapy. Interesting. After after therapy, though that extreme stress response was gone. Yeah. But the special attention to identify a spider to was have still there. Huge was still there. And but the stress response was gone. Mm. So the brain hadn't really yeah, the brain had changed because it was not inducing the, the stress one, but the selective attention towards the spiders will never change in the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. So, and what I'm what I'm postulating now is horses are spider phobics. Or the spider phobia is a spider very, <laughs> very good model for a horse. <clears throat> Okay. Because there's an old theory, no, Seligman was the, the researcher who said that humans are prone to develop uh, phobias on certain stimuli, snakes, mm -hmm. heights, spiders. Mm -hmm. And he suggested a pathway from the thalamus direct, directly through the fear network to the amygdala. Mm -hmm. And it is there. See, and, and what we do when, when we see a fear evoking stimulus, we suppress that old pathway that connects the, 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 the central impression or the picture, for example, of a fearful stimulus to the, the, the anxiety network. So we, we overcome, we overwrite this old pathway with our prefrontal cortex. Yeah, and send the information first through the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, that's why our reaction times are much longer than the ones of horses. But in spider phobics, you can see when, if, when this this override yeah. pathway, this younger pathway, evolutionary younger pathway, is out of function. Mm -hmm. So if we want to understand the fear reaction of a horse, a spider phobic is not the bad. It's not a bad model. It's actually quite a good model. The only exception is that horses don't stand beside themselves well. That could have been a, um, a saber to a tiger, <laughs> because those horses who did that are not alive anymore. No, no, exactly. <clears throat> but you know what the good thing is? We can treat that excessive stress response away with systematic desensitization. And that's, that's, in exactly, horses. Ex that's exactly mm -hmm. what we do with horses when we train them. When we train them to be fear resistant, we expose them to many, many stimulus and systematically desensitize them. Mm -hmm. make, does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. I was just not sure if you were ending with a sentence or if there was um, coming more. I'm taking yeah. a break. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking, okay. <laughs> take a break, take a sip of water. Yeah, yeah that, um, that of course absolutely, absolutely makes sense. Also, when we are seeing that in the relationship of that Horses first have to learn to be familiar with humans and to interpret our intentions of, for, for not getting feared, scared basically each time you're lifting your arm, right? Um, <clears throat> you want me to I'm comment also... on your horse? Hmm? You, want to, you want to further exaggerate or shall I go back to this, the case of your horse? Um, we, can go, uh, we can go a little further there. So like, we can go back to the case of my horse. Uh, and I just wanted to say that I also remember that we said horses have a nearly photographic memory. Humans don't, right? And I guess that is sometimes also difficult. I, I also believe that many people don't really understand what trauma is in humans. So we just very quickly, we see a horse running and then we are quickly saying, yeah, this horse is traumatized. Um, or we see a big reaction from a horse and quickly say this horse is traumatized without even understanding um, what trauma is and that it's sometimes difficult to just breathe it away. Um, <clears throat> so therefore, I, I would, I think it would make sense if we are spending a little bit more time on that and go back to that case. Yeah, yeah I'm sure your horse is not traumatized. Yeah, I'm, sure I'm also you, pretty sure. Yeah. I'm sure your horse has a fear reaction to the rope that is possibly conditioned. Because if a horse never has seen a rope, why should it be fearful? 
So it probably associates some negative stressful experiences with the rope. Um, but a, a, a really severely traumatized horse would be disresponsive, it would be shut down. And, and I've seen one time in my life such a horse and it was just standing in the corner and stalled and would not react to anything anymore. And that has something to do, with, and it's sort of a, it would be the equivalent, not to re, not try to be too un, anthropomorphic here, but it would be the equivalent to a major depression. And the problem there is that there's the two, the basic two classes of stress hormones. One is the, the glucocorticoids, the cortisol, and one is the, the catecholamines. And the cortisol can actually um, can actually be, destroy areas in your brain. And uh, so in very extreme situations, cortisol is secreted in very, very high doses. And um, that is usually the, the stress hormone that makes this reaction. So in this case, I would say a horse is traumatized. But it's not an on and off. You can have, of course, a horse with a very severe fear reaction uh, due to to maybe that horse has been in a, in a car accident and is afraid of cars. Then, you know, depending how extreme it is, I would find the, the word trauma may be okay. I would also, um, but it's, it's still, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a continuum, right? Um, but the reaction that you described from your horse, I would not, I, I hear sometimes people, oh, he doesn't like the, the uh, the terrier he has been traumatized by mm, has been traumatized I mean, that, that is yeah. not appropriate no. if you have ever seen a really traumatized horse you know that that is not appropriate right yeah and um so i would like an, another maybe another example from 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 the human realm um, from clinical psychology um and that would be a post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. and in a post-traumatic stress disorder something similar to the the spider phobia happens just way more severe. Because what happens to these people is that they, when they have a stimulus, and that's what I said, the thalamus is really important because it connects stimulus, for example, a visual stimulus, to the fear reaction. Mm -hmm. And in, in these severe cases, stimuli that remind the person or that, that remind is, is wrong because it's actually not the controlled memory, it triggers the fear uh, response without a memory and without that loop about the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And people feel this like they have been, for example, veterans, like they have been in that combat situation, they got traumatized again. It's real for them. Um, but, and, and the thing is, we have, you know, a lot of studies about resilience against trauma. And, we all, and, and people are, when they're older, when they have more uh, life experience, are less vulnerable to trauma. But we do know that from, from wars, uh, from civil wars in particular, and actually from civilians, not so much from, from veterans, but we of course have learned a lot, a lot about veterans, mm -hmm. is that everybody gets severely traumatized. Everybody can get a post-traumatic stress disorder. It is just a matter of, of how many of these experiences they have. And mm -hmm. that sort of brings me a little bit to the, the use of the word trauma in horses. I would say most fear responses that that when people come to you as a trainer and say yeah. my horse reacts so and so are not trauma, but it is also and and a horse that's so shut down that you know it's it, you you can't get contact to it anymore. It just doesn't react not to other horses, not to you, not to anything. You can beat that horse up; it wouldn't wouldn't react. It wouldn't move exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That is learned helplessness, and that's a severe form of trauma. So there's no doubt that that is a trauma. Um, a horse that has this, like I said, maybe been in an accident, and if you can't desensitize it, it's probably a trauma. But it's it's a continuum, and I think I have heard mm -hmm. the, the word trauma used so often for things that I think this this is something that you can retrain, and as long as you can retrain it away, it's probably not a trauma. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Mm, that that is one thing and then I also I am so often standing there and then I'm looking at the horse you know and now I'm been studying the recent years also because I had to uh, <clears throat> quite a lot about pain and pain reactions and um, yeah not only the equine pain phase but, but everything around discomfort in equines that um, I sometimes feel that trauma is used as an excuse 
before, you know, the horse is traumatized. It was, it happened on its owner, with its owner before. It's 10 years ago, but it's still traumatized. And that's the reason why it still can't sleep. And that is, of course, that is for me as a trainer always a little bit difficult because I'm, uh, I, I really truly believe that even if there was something in the past, we can't take that as an excuse for a bad today status. No. And, and the thing is, um, I think this is really, the, the topic trauma is too complex to use it, as, to just mm. use it in, in all these uh, situations. Because um, a stress reaction or a, uh, or a fear reaction, that, it usually goes together. So the, the physical reaction will be very similar if you have a um, yeah, if you if you have a stress reaction mm -hmm. due due to a physical issue, for example, pain, or let, let's put it that way, um, the it's like this worry cup model. Mm -hmm. If 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 you have a sound and healthy horse, and you train it, and it's confronted with a scary situation, it will probably have a a, a fear reaction, but it may not be as exaggerated, and you you will have it. It will be most e most easier to uh, to to train this horse. Mm -hmm. If you compare it to a horse that already has a higher stress level, let's define a threshold where a horse would yeah. hold. Yeah. Right. Let's define a threshold where a horse so would we hold. We take we so, take our worry cup here, and then when the worry yeah. cup is full, the horse is starting. Exactly. Bolting. If it's half full, then it doesn't really take much for the horse yeah. to bolt. If it's empty, you actually have so much more to to go for. And when I come to come back to the case of your horse. Mm. Um, let's think uh, you say you said you have discovered a pain issue after a while that was it yeah. and that was mm. quite complicated Yeah. Mm. so let's think if you train this horse with a lot of pressure which is stressful and it's a lot of um, I mean horses learn very well and they learn from pressure but light pressure is usually enough but some training methods use a huge amount of pressure based on a leader concept that, in my understanding, I mean, other people may may think differently, and I'm I'm not a horse trainer really, but I would say that they're misunderstood. So if you train a horse with a lot of pressure, it will probably learn very fast. But if that horse has an issue that's before that, yeah. mm -hmm. then then it might so that for a horse that sound it might be a half full very cup. But for a horse that has a pain issue and is stressed anyway, mm. and then you put a training method that's very stressful on top, you might as well get an exaggerated fear response or stress response from that combination of an underlying issue and a training method that uses a lot of pressure. Right? And then, of course, you will get a conditioned response like you have seen. If that rope has been used for training, you mm. say you have seen that in the video, you will get an exaggerated response because that horse was probably trained while, while in pain, already stressed with that method. Then the stress that was, even if your horse is sound now, that combined stressful situation is still in the horse's brain. It still yeah. remembers that exaggerated response. It, he doesn't remember, he, he he's not... He doesn't have that overdeveloped prefrontal cortex <laughs> and says, uh, okay, uh, my, my pain issue is solved, so I shouldn't be as stressed. And in fact, pain patients don't do that either. Mm. The person that really struggles with constant pain will react to the slightest stimulus that reminds him that that, that patient yeah. had it. Think about uh, going to the dentist. Yeah. It doesn't help. If you say, well, you know, we use sedation and so on, and when we use uh, anesthesia, and you it, you won't it. feel anything. You sit there sweating, having that response. Oh, and that's your, yeah. yeah. That's your poor horse in the round pen being reminded with with uh, with the lead rope um, that something happened. And even also, also, we have to say that in situations like this, when we are using so much pressure. Um, most likely the horse doesn't learn to, what to do. It learns what to avoid, right? Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a very big difference. So it doesn't get strategies for solutions. It's just getting a strategy for avoiding more pressure. No, 
Not necessarily. Um, I think that depends on how you use it. Because in, in writing, whenever we use pressure and take it away, we would use the same method, but very, very mild. So, so the, the point is, when do you take it away? Uh, and and it, for example, if, if, you do, if you think writing signals, mm. what you would like to do is to use minimum pressure. Mm. But it would still be something called negative reinforcement. And that yeah. is you, you give a stimulus and take it away. But you, you would like to, and and that yeah, is- Yeah, but that's the point, right? Point. You take it away. You take it away. The and gives that's mm. Exactly. And that is the point. First of all, you don't want to use a lot of pressure. You want to use just the right amount of pressure to evoke the response and then go down with the pressure. Mm -hmm. So you want you want to start with the lowest amount of pressure, not with the highest amount of pressure. And in many of these dominance-based um, educational system mm -hmm. training systems, the pressures I find they used to begin with is are quite high. So you can use so so I, I, when I try to explain that with with negative reinforcement, mm -hmm. I say you don't need to use a, a, a stimulus that's painful or noisy or loud or whatever. It is absolutely enough if you use a stimulus that's a little bit nagging. So if you take the pisk and make tap, 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 it's like a fly if you do it, but it's sort of nagging and they go away. And it would still be negative reinforcement when you stop it at the right time. I, I, would, so even, I would even say, yeah, I would even say that um, I am working a lot with visual cues. So not even touching, but visual cues when we are thinking academic groundwork and stuff. So that the, the whip is not necessarily touching the horse or I'd not even take always the whip. Sometimes I just take my fingertip, turn my body and use my fingertip for strengthening and still the horse is understanding it as negative reinforcement. Because even there, I'm just giving this visual cue, I'm building up a pressure with my presence, with my yeah. dominance moving into the horse's eye um, <clears throat> and releasing that pressure the moment I'm turning away. So even exactly. that is pressure. Yeah, exactly. And that's the point. You have to release. And then it's it's a good training method because, um, first of all, you, you're very clear in your signal. And the other, it's a reward. Yeah, exactly. It's a reward. Negative reinforcement is a reward. It shouldn't be stress. But if your timing is bad, it can be extremely mm. stressful. Uh, so so that's sort of, um, so first of all, if the dosage is, is really high, you, you don't need that in horses because they're so sensible. Um, then it is stressful. Yeah, but humans uh, are not. But what did you say? <laughs> humans are not so. <clears throat> not no, no, exactly. <laughs> That's the point. Uh, I, I think horses must think we are so we are so unpolite mm. and, and just just really not not comfortable people. Yeah. So um, so I I think that's that's part of part of the issue here, which brings me to another point. And you mentioned the the five domains model, and I think that is really really important. Um, we need to be sure that we have excluded everything. And from my own experience with my horses, I had a horse that I had, had been to the vet at least three times with the same issue, and they said it's it's not there. So it's not always that you can be successful, but um, but I think you should at least try it to say, well, it has a past experience and it's it's you know it's fearful because of that. That's not enough. I think it's it's at least important to make an effort to exclude all health issues. And and the thing is, again, I would like to go back to humans mm. and, and give an example. I used to work in uh, gastroenterology, in fact, because mm -hmm. it it, um, it was I was interested in psychosomatics, which is sort of very related to biopsychology, because um, diseases change the physiology. And, and persons react towards it. So pain will change the personality. If you have chronic pain, it will change your personality. Um, so so that, that's why I was interested in that. And there's a syndrome called irritable bowel syndrome. syndrome. And 20, 30 years ago, I was engaged in that topic. And the thing was that we were trying to find a definition that was not based on excluding everything else. Mm. Ah, we have the same problem in horses. Yeah, exactly. Nowadays. That's yeah. that's mm. exactly the same problem. We were we wanted to have a positive diagnosis that was not based on well, you don't have anything, so you probably have irritable bowel syndrome, which is not good for a patient, really. No, 
But so and it has it has two sides on it. I have seen patients that got the the diagnosis irritable irritable bowel syndrome. It turns out they had a, a, a colorectal cancer. Great, that wasn't good, right? Uh, but on the other hand, I've seen many many desperate patients where the doctor said we can't do anything for you. They they were not, they didn't have it. They they were really suffering, and the doctor said, well, you know, I'm sorry. There was probably psychosomatics is in your head. Lovely, and that. That's Thank really you. bad. Mm. Meanwhile, we know there's a physiological basis. Things have changed, and it's much easier now to, to give the diagnosis. But at that time, it was exactly that, to find that balance. But we should be careful not to label a horse with something like the irritable bowel syndrome because we don't have a better idea. So we have to exclude all, I mean, all the other domains. Kind of trauma or whatever. We have to exclude, first of all, the, the physical things. We have to check that they're physically sound. And then, of course, when we look at their mental health, there may be a lot in the, in how, the way they're housed, the way they're fed. So, so in general, animal or horse welfare issues, that, that might cause the problem. So, also um, mobbing. Mobbing is a big problem oh, yes, in and, groups. Yes, yeah. a, a disharmonic uh, herd. A group could be a real problem. So we, we also need to, to look at that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So if we are trying to um, to wrap that a little, <clears throat> then the first thing I think that we need to understand is um, the brain is differently wired. The brain of humans and horses, though we have similar ingredients, compartments in there, it's still differently wired. So we can't compare reaction A to to reaction B necessarily. No, the thing is, I wouldn't say it's differently wired, but I would say with every development that comes, uh, see, the problem with evolution is evolution does not forget. Mm -hmm. Evolution does not forget. It can only suppress and build over. Yeah. That's that's a point. So you you are in fact right that it that we have the same brain structure, but they're differently developed and differently wired. Because a uh, younger brain structure may have invented an evolution, might have invented something new with a new brain structure. But the problem is the old structures are still there. That's what happens to the spider phobic. That's what happens to the spider phobic, but not the other way around. So the horse can't just not suddenly develop a yeah. No, exactly. And that's the point. I mean, we are able to conclude, for example, from, from an, an, an animal, from a cat or a rat, that's why we use them in laboratory experiments, to humans, the basic function. But we cannot conclude from humans down. Down. That's not possible. Yeah, I think that is a really important sentence. And I also know, I just encourage you guys who are listening, I see that we have a, quite a few listeners here, um, that there were a few uh, questions to Frauke in the morning. Please just put them in the chat and I will read them out. I'm monitoring Facebook here with one eye. That's the reason why I'm always looking down. <laughs> I know that this multitasking is so difficult. Uh, it's really I, difficult. And I hate it. Smiling <laughs> politely at the same time. So <clears throat> that was point number one that we wanted to make clear. So we have a little different uh, wiring there. So we can't, you said that very beautiful. We can't conclude from humans down. In this exactly. Situation. We can cl conclude from animals up to humans because the basic the basic reactions are very similar, but uh, we cannot conclude down. And the reason for that is, is in fact, this very developed prefrontal cortex. So you, you what, what we can, we can do, we can do um, uh, some type of therapy in, Nor in Norwegian. We can talk to a patient. We can explain to a patient. A horse, we can't do that. But we still, for example, the training method, systematic desensitization. So many of the learning um, uh, laws, laws of learning, apply to all all animals. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, so we can use that. But um, we cannot do, for example, a cognitive behavior therapy. We can do a behavior therapy with horses. We cannot do a cognitive behavior cognitive therapy behavior. because they their brains are wired for a different purpose. Yeah. Then we often see this overreactions in horses, and then you have explained very nicely, this is not a traumatized horse. A traumatized horse is a horse that is completely shut down and that doesn't react to any stimulus, uh, stimulus anymore. 
I would say there it is clear that that is a traumatized horse because mm. it, it would have would be similar to a major depression. But I think there's there's um, an in between thing. For example, if a horse had been in a car accident and had developed a fear of cars, I'm not sure whether that would be possible to treat that away or it would take a long time. So and that I is think, the question, right? Is it possible yeah. to train or not train? Yes, and that's the point. Can I train it away? Then I would say it's not a trauma. Um, but it could be quite selective. The horse could be just fine. But when the um, when it is in the same situation, it could actually have some reactions that are not controllable, not not um, you, you, you train and not be not treatable. And then I would say that's where trauma begins, right? And the extreme trauma is the the shutdown horse. And if you look at the stress hormones, they usually go if you have a short lasting stress reaction. The catecholamines mm -hmm. they're very high. And that these are the hormones that mediate the fight flight response, extremely in horses, but also in us. Mm -hmm. But if you have chronic stress and it's long lasting, then the catechia means they take over. And in people with depression or with severe trauma, they actually don't have a lot of catechia means anymore because they had an extreme category, uh, I mean, reaction, um, a glucocorticoid reaction, sorry, not mm -hmm. catechia means the cortisol mm -hmm. reaction was extreme. And then the brain learns to suppress that reaction. Uh, and and the, the, the glucocorticoids, the corticoids in humans, cortisol in humans, but also in horses, it destroys areas of the brain. And that is not, when it's extreme, it's not reversible. And that is why it's so difficult to help these people. And that is why it's so difficult to help these horses. There's no doubt that that is a trauma. But I think there's, there's possibly uh, an area in between. But I would say if you if you're not if you can't manage to have a successful treatment, you're probably starting to be in the realm of trauma. Yeah, and when you are then talking about, or, or also think of another important tool that we have mentioned now many times during the, this conversation is that when we are suspecting a horse to, or when we are having a horse with special effects, let's say it like this: we have a horse with special effects. It's always worse having a look at the five domain model. Yes, absolutely. And looking at everything around because it might just be a horse that is telling us about its worries. It might just be a horse, and that we will see in 98% of all cases. Um, <clears throat> it might just be a horse that has not given up on sending us messages and is uh, trying to protect itself. Yes, and I think if it's still if you have a, still a reactive horse you're actually on the good side mm -hmm. because you have it's it's not good i mean it's dangerous but you have a horse that's still reacting which is yes. not the case when a horse is shut down then then it's really really difficult to get the grip of the situation so um it's, it's like you say we still have a horse that tries to tell us something and i really think it makes sense to work systematically through the five domains model to start with the physical soundness uh, the lowest level then to look at the group and at the social environment to look does it have enough enough turnout to look um is there something with the feeding and and so on so i think i think before we go into the realm of psychotherapy which would be training a trauma away um, we really should look, is there anything else that sort of keeps the stress level high? There might mm. still be an issue and a fear issue that has been conditioned. But it, we, we have it so much more difficult if we don't, if that comes with a half full worry cup. Yeah. yeah. So if we, if, if we manage to empty, to empty the worry cup and take all the other stresses away, mm. we have a much better chance to treat the isolated problem. And it is so often, you know, like a little bit like unpeeling the onion. And yeah, just, exactly. Just this exactly. morning, I had a student, and I know she had a question for you. So I'm waiting, Sersa, for your question here. Um, <clears throat> um, she just got a new horse, and that is very interesting to train because he's doing two steps on the riding arena, freezing. Ooh. Two steps on the riding arena, freezing. So. <clears throat> That in this severity, I have not seen in a very long time. And there we can talk minimum about a very severe stress response. And now we are starting to dig down. Where is it coming from? Is it the worry cup that is full because of something? Is that learned behavior? Is this 
trauma in in uh, some some way but he's responding on um, the very first lessons already so well that I don't believe it's trauma it's a very just a very stressed horse yeah it's probably new to him I don't know how long has he been there he has been there now since a few months so she gave him good time okay. to settle in okay. and okay. Uh, yeah. did some healthcare stuff first before she thought now it's a good moment for starting to train and was then herself also surprised because we we also discovered that of course when she takes the horse to a lesson also the human factor is not nothing right so she's a little bit stressed the teacher is looking you also would like to show your teacher that you have prepared the new horse well and then you're going into this endless feedback loop in between horse and human that is yeah, sometimes interesting. Well, horses know exactly what kind of mood we are in. They can smell it, they can feel it. There are many studies showing that horses know exactly. They even look at our faces. They can even recognize faces of fear and 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 uh, when you smile or when you're good. So they're ex they're social animals and they read each other from a long distance. And actually, the, the signals horses send are so much more subtle than what we do. Absolutely, so for them, yeah. we are probably so easy to read. Mm -hmm. Not talking about the smell. <laughs> Not talking about <laughs> exactly. Not talking about the smell. But then in German we have this saying, the horse is your mirror. I also have a little bit stomach pain. I have a little bit stomach pain with that because that is taking away the allowance for the horse to have its own issues. There you're back at the five domain model right so there you're putting everything onto just the horse human relationship um mm, i am also not there but it's definitely a part of the story i would say yeah i'm sure that i mean i i have heard that before and i think i don't know it's um i find it a con complicated concept because a horse may react differently i mean if you're stressed mm -hmm. some horses may be stressed and it's your mirror um but my frau for example would say you know what just get your stuff together. I'm going yeah. here and eat. And when you're ready, you can come. So I think yeah. that's also a very inter-individual reaction to, to that. So, and then he's not mirroring me because he's exactly no. doing that, what I'm not the doing. Opposite. Okay, now, yeah, yeah, I also, I have a, I have Despino. He's just like, today he's 20. He says, so don't worry, I carry you through. And then I have the youngsters who are saying, mommy is scared. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's get scared exactly. together. <laughs> But this is a different podcast and this is a different topic. So I would say we wrap this up and I say thank you for tonight. If there's no more questions, we are ending this here for tonight. And I will, um, for everybody who's interested in uh, reading a little bit into Focus Block, we are putting that into our uh, show notes. We are mentioning that in our show notes. and. Um, yeah, then I would say thank you for tonight. Thanks for having me, and it was a lot of fun. It usual. was a lot of fun, as <laughs> usual. Okay, now, <clears throat> sometimes we take our coffee conversations live online, and otherwise we exactly. just do them <laughs> in private, and I get another, I, I get a private lecture. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for tonight. Yes. Have a nice rest of the evening, and um, see you back very soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Thank you.